the introduction and now I'm checking that all the technology is working. This conference or this call is being recorded and what we will do is we will release it on the Computer Arts Society website and YouTube channel either this evening or tomorrow morning um, and then uh, you can watch that at any time you like. If you want to look at the previous talks they're all in, in the same place so they've been and this is the fourth so there have been three previous ones and hopefully um, well that I'll talk about this at the end, but definitely there'll be another season of them. So um, while, the, while we're all in lockdown, I think they offer a, a sort of weekly <clears throat> opportunity to hear about uh, some interesting work. And I'm sure after lockdown, we'll continue to run them in some form, be it monthly or um, maybe even fortnightly, we shall see. So what I will now do is I will hand you over to Ernest Edmonds. Um, I, would, I would say that Ernest doesn't need any introduction. Um, because I'm sure many of, all of you must, have, must be aware of his work. Um, but I would maybe ask Ernest to give a very short introduction to himself, um, and then we can um, start your formal presentation. Okay, so Ernest, over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about my a bit of personal history here. So in a way, I'll be introducing some of myself. But um, just to say that I joined the Computer Art Society in 68 or 69. Um, and I've been involved with you guys all along. Um, I suppose the only other thing I'd say about myself is I see my work as transdisciplinary. I work in both computer science and in art. Um, and you'll see a hint of that, maybe. But today, I want to talk about network art in a lockdown time. And maybe one background point to that is I was in Australia late last year and early this year and I had a realization that my work which is really very abstract uh, in its nature related quite a lot to the big crisis of the time which actually was fire if you remember the fires in Australia that was the big news and on Australian television at the time you saw nothing else but news about the fires. Um, and so I started to look at my work in that context. Things changed. So now it's the virus time. And I realized that um, there's a strain of my work, not all of my work, but one strain of my work that has been going on for a very long time, which is very relevant to this. So I wanted to talk about that. I'll talk about it in a general sense a little bit and I'll go through my personal history and talk with you about that also. Um, okay. But I have a small issue here. I don't know. Ah, okay, got it. Sorry about that. Um, okay, lockdown time. What does it mean? Well, it means, for example, we don't go to art galleries, we don't go to performances, to the theatre, and so on. Um, we don't go to lectures in lecture theatres. We don't go to workshops in rooms. We do things like we're doing this very now. We're all in our own homes, most probably, or uh, on our own, more or less, or with one or two other people communicating over the internet through screens. One of the things that happens in lockdown time is that people try to make life go on as normal in many ways. And for the art world, what we see a great deal of is showing art through screens across the internet. You can go to galleries and you can tour the gallery, you can see the artwork, exhibitions that were there originally just to be seen by visiting the gallery are now visitable. You can visit them on the internet. But the art that we look at in that way is art that was never intended to be seen on the screen. So the issue has arisen about what do we do in this lockdown time as artists? What do artists do? What should we be providing? And uh, Nick Lambert, who may well be out there somewhere in this particular community, he usually is most weeks, put this note round the article in Artnet News by uh, Daniel Birnbaum, 
uh, recently, which made this point. Of course, he made this this article. Daniel made this point in relation to VR because that's what his company is particularly concerned with. But it raised the very important issue of art in this time, and how should it be? What kind of art should it be? And that's what I want to talk about. I made a couple of remarks not to do with networks, just to start with. Um, it's art on screens and art over the internet that we're talking about in general. Here's, of course, both of these pictures you're seeing on screens, but the images you see, one is of a painting in a gallery with a person watching it. In fact, that painting is in a gallery in the city of Sheffield, near to where I physically am at this moment. You probably know who painted it. And there's a picture of that painting as seen on a screen. Now, what we all know, I don't really have to tell anyone, what we all know, it's a very different experience to see that image on a screen, to see the painting for real, just as it's very different to see a picture of that painting in a book as against going and seeing the painting. Of course, seeing it on a screen or in a book is very good and very helpful, um, but it doesn't quite compete to seeing the painting for real because Colonel Leto didn't paint his paintings to be seen on screens. Now let's take something more closer to the Computer Art Society's world. This is actually a print in the Computer Art Society collection. It's a print by Paul Brown, who's probably not out there in this collection because he's in Australia at the moment and it's the middle of the night for him. Um, but you're not seeing this print anymore, uh, really, as you were seeing the Canaletto. This print is printed on paper and it looks quite different to what you see in front of you now. And Paul makes work to go on screens, right? But this particular work wasn't for a screen. I can only show it you this way. Why is it, why do I want to stress so much about the difference? Well, largely it's about color. Uh, on a screen, you're looking at transmitted light. If it's a print or a painting, you're looking at reflected light. Now, in fact, the color range is quite different in those two forms. So there are colors you can have in transmitted light, you can't have in reflected and vice versa. Perhaps it's easier to think about it if you think about stained glass windows. It's impossible to paint a painting of a stained glass window that looks the same as the stained glass window. Of course, you can get close, you can try hard and so on. So for, for our time now, for the issue of looking at things on screen and across the internet, uh, much as I love Paul's work, this isn't an example of Paul's work that is best shown in this way. We want to see other examples of his work that he made for screens. Right? So one thing is making art for screens. Now I'm going to only talk about one aspect of that for the rest of the time that Sean allows me. Uh, I'm going to talk about network art and in particular Network art, where participants interact through the art system, so there's more than one participant. The participants are not a dull audience just watching, they're interacting with the artwork, and indeed in some sense or another, interacting with one another through the art system. So this is the kind of uh, example of network art that I want to talk about. Uh, Roy Ascot actually referred to it in a famous pair of papers he wrote in 66 and 67 in the journal Cybernetics. He talked about many, many things, but he talked about, for example, an artist brought into the working studio of another artist, people working together creatively through networks. So this was a, a, a vision, if you like, of this future. And I'm going to give you my personal story, interleave with a few other remarks, uh, in that context. 
I started work on a series of pieces called Communications Game in 1970. I hadn't actually read that article by Roy at that time, I confess, but we, I knew people who knew him and I probably, it was probably permeating through the system as it were in the air was his ideas. So I should acknowledge his thinking. Um, the first communications game piece was shown in, a, in an exhibition at Leicester Polytechnic in 1971. It was called The Invention of Problems, organized by the late Stroud Cornock, uh, also a very prominent member of the Computer Arts Society, as many of you will remember. This work consisted of six locations, six booths, where people could privately stand and interact with the system or interact in effect with one another through the system. They had switches that they could throw and when they threw the switches they changed the lights in other booths around this, uh, this work and vice versa. So there was a kind of communication going on, not a communication of words or with meaning, but there was something going on where people could sense that other people were uh, it affecting what they could see. Well, this was of course a local area network, I didn't call it that at that time and in fact I didn't use computers at all, I designed a logic circuit and got a soldering iron out and made the network with pieces of wire and switches and whatnot. Um, and there were, there were a few versions of this, there's a note I made at the time but really it was a conceptual work um, that was not specific to the hardware that I displayed. It was the functionality, the way that it enabled people to communicate with one another, communicating quotes. And that communication was the artwork in my view. So this was network art, local area network art, of course, at that time. Um, just slightly later, uh, Steve Willett's magazine, Control magazine, issued uh, its sixth copy. And in its sixth copy, it had a group of people, including myself. We were all, in fact, to be part of the 1972 exhibition of the Middle Group Gallery in Nottingham, Commission and Control. And in that, I showed the second version of this, which, only, which physically looked a bit like this. There's an old drawing of it. Um, enabling three people to communicate with one another through this network, seeing lights, switch, switches, and the experience of switching the switches and seeing the lights change uh, was the art. Um, lots of things were going on at that time. ARPANET, which had, of course been being developed for quite a long time, had its big demonstration. Just then Ethernet was invented at Xerox Park. Internet, the internet in effect got going, was named and so on. So everything in the network world was happening just then or just after then. So it was a very kind of hot area. And in fact, the Computer Arts Society, and I think hopefully if we look in the archives, we'll find out about this, held a conference in Edinburgh in 1973. And I talked about this work at that conference. And to uh, the first line or so of the paper, I was introducing a type of artwork that involves a small group of people interacting with one another without setting goals through the work. And that was the art. It was a small group of people because, you know, I had to actually build this thing, uh, solder together lots of pieces of wire, and I only ever did it for a small number of people. So, this was where I started my interest. And it was actually initiated by my discussion with psychologists who were looking at how very, very young children interacted with other people, usually their parents. So this is pre-language, but what they showed was that there clearly was some kind of interaction going on, which let's call it me meaningful. Uh, there was some sense to it and there was some order to it and I was trying to capture something of that in this artwork. And later on, actually with Sean's help, but, um, 
this has been reconstructed. This was a, an example of it shown in primary codes in Rio in 2015. So the work still exists in slightly different physical forms. In that time that I'm now talking about, the late 70s, big changes happened. So we were doing this before the PC, but in 77, Apple II, and in 81, there was the PC, big change. And then lots of people started to do network art of one kind or another. I'm not going to describe all these pieces, but I'll just put up a few reminders of some examples of some stuff that was going on at that time. Or Asuka again did this very important work uh, involving lots of people in lots of places. Uh, there was this important Canadian initiative. Um, and in 89, the web began. So we see this world shifting towards networks in quite a big, big way. And in 1990, again, with uh, Steve Willits, uh, I took part in an exhibition called Art Creating Society that he curated at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford. And he also made a special issue of Control Magazine, number 14, showing all that work. What I made there was another version of um, communications game, but this time I actually did use computers and a local area network to build it. In fact, the plan had been to use a wide area network and connect it to a remote uh, mainframe computer in, in Oxford, but the arrangements with the company didn't work out, so it was actually shown as just a local area network piece. And then, Lots of people were doing lots of things. Um, so I'll just put up a few that you probably know about. Famous works, networked art grew a great deal around this time. The facilities were there, uh, famous pieces were made, uh, and we were on the roll for network art. But I want to just come back now, I'm just telling a personal story uh, about what I then began to do in relation to communications game, taking it further in this new technological context to something called Cities Tango and beyond that. So back to my personal story. I have to mention something that's not to do with networks first. I have for a long time now, been since 2007, 13 years, been making a series of works. Uh, the, the series name is Shaping Form. Uh, these are works which are on screens or walls with a camera. Um, they, uh, people interact with them, but the main point is that they change, their behavior changes over long periods of time, influenced by the behavior in front of them. The details of that I'm going to skip for today. It's not important for my talk today. Um, a couple of years after I did the first ones of those, I put it onto the web and we started to make shaping forms on the web, which was like, like multi-user interaction. So here again, it was network art using shaping form. And then the next development was a series of works called Cities Tango, which was basically connecting two different cities together. And I'll show you a couple of images from one of the examples, which was between Belfast and Sydney. Uh, the Belfast uh, end of it was in the ICEA conference of 2009, Belfast in the exhibition there. Um, here's a, a screen that was on display in Sydney. So to explain this work a bit, this was a bit like shaping forms, which is colors and shapes changing uh, according to generative art stuff that I'm not going to go into. Um, as a result of interaction with people nearby, uh, their motions being picked up by cameras. But there was more than one of these screens and they were in different places. So on this particular example, there was one such screen with a camera in Sydney and another one in Belfast and they were connected together over the internet. And 
Um, the people in Sydney would from time to time, instead of a colour, see an image from Belfast and vice versa. But sometimes they would actually see an image of a person standing in front of the computer in the other location. So there was a montage, you might say, of colour, of images of the remote location and of actual live images from the remote location is a snippet of video taken uh, at that time in Belfast where <coughs> you see the kind of things that were seen by people in Belfast uh, and you can see just to the right of that screen there's a camera which is dealing with the uh, local movement and taking pictures of the local people. I worked with Sean himself a few times and here's a little video that we made in 2016 of a work that we did together. So this was a collaborative work between our host Sean Clark and myself and um, the image there, the location that you see behind those colours is Rio de Janeiro and I think the other end was Leicester in England. Um, and this, this is the same kind of thing. Again, it was only two screens, but by then, in this work I was doing with Sean, we'd realised that it doesn't have to be two, it could be three, four, five, ten, a hundred. And then you have a network of art objects interacting with one another, as well as interacting with the people uh, in the various locations, looking at or moving around in front of the screens. So jumping to much more recent times, um, I've been working again with some other collaborators on a work called H-Space, which is using uh, interactive augmented reality now, actually, at Leicester, at what was at that time Leicester Polytechnic, I was working on virtual reality in 1985, four. Um, but never really made any satisfactory artworks with it because the technology was too primitive for my taste. But today, the technology is really quite advanced and, prim and not primitive at all. And we're able to make interactive work using, this is the Microsoft HoloLens, um, and because we can use um, technology on the internet to drive it, we can build versions of something like the City Tango work that I was referring to, uh, but using virtual reality. Now here's a diagram, I need to explain a little bit about the concept of this work. Obviously there's a server somewhere and that server is actually driving it the way this works. Um, and there are two things going on really. One is that when you uh, look through this, um, these goggles, this HoloLens, as part from seeing whatever the scene is in front of you, you sometimes see virtual sculptures, blocks of color, columns of color, squares of color and so on what I'm terming the virtual sculptures. But because, it, because two or more people can be involved in this network, you also sometimes see images from somewhere else. So the person in Sydney might see something that the person in Guangzhou is looking at. And the person in Guangzhou might see beside something that they're looking at, something that the Sydney person is looking at. So again, this I only show this diagram with two nodes, but of course there can be many. And obviously, as you all know very well, you don't necessarily these days have to use fancy headsets like the HoloLens to do it. There are much cheaper ways of being involved in these things. And in fact, it can be done on phones. So here's an example using an Android phone, actually. Um, of, to be honest, a prototype artwork. But the image there you see that's being seen is actually in a different country to the location where that phone is being held. 
So what we're seeing here <coughs> is a network art that can be delivered in the home, in fact, anywhere where you are, on a phone equally well on a computer, so you can have a blend of computers and phones and whatever, but it's screen-based art. And you notice the colours, for example, the colour that you see there to the right, that and so on. These, of course, being chosen carefully to be appropriate for screens. And in fact, I find that once we start to move to the phone, I need to use slightly different colours to the ones I would use if I was doing them for delivery on big screens. There's another example. This is where here the phone is being held still uh, and you're getting virtual. Okay, so this is actually between England and Australia. Um, and you might at times see people, you might at times see scenes, you might at times cause the what you're watching to change because of the way you move or what you do. You might attain, at times see something that's affected by what the people on other nodes of this network are doing. So the physical art, like the paintings on the screen there, and the virtual art uh, seen through, in this case, these augmented reality, uh, this augmented reality headset start to join together in a network, bringing a community of people together in a networked art. So my argument is that networked art in a lockdown time is very important way forward. It has a history, a 50 year history at least, but we need it to be art that's made for networks. And a few of the things to think about is that we're using transmitted light, for example, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we can have and probably benefit a lot from interaction of one kind or another. That we're concerned with two things that are important to us when we're locked down, communication and connection. These are things that matter to us uh, as locked down people and that art can deal with and deliver. All of this is only a one strand of my own art. I do completely different things to this. I'm not suggesting that anyone should make this their only strand of their art, but I am suggesting that this is a form of art that is looking more and more important in the kind of time that we're living in. And I'm sure Sean will forgive me if I plug <laughs> a couple of books. Uh, Francesca, as you've heard Francesca before, her book has just come out in paperback. I've uh, got this book recently out with Maggie Bowden. Um, and there's lots of stuff written about this, which you can get to on my website in paper form. Not the books, but the papers, um, if you want to know more. Or you can ask me questions. There we are, Sean, I'll stop there. Great. Okay, well, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking. Am I unmuted? I can hear you, Sean. Oh, okay, great. Um, that, that was uh, extremely interesting. Obviously, I have lots of questions, but I think other people would like to have questions as well. So if you would like to ask a question, if you can raise your hand, what I will do is I will bring you in to the uh, conversation. So I can, so um, like I say, I'm new to this way of doing it, but I shall bring Francesca back. What I will do, Francesca, is I shall bring you in as a panelist. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> ah, oh, ah, no, of course. You don't have to show your camera, yeah. Okay. No, that was, that was fascinating. Um, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by, by Ernest's work, of course, and um, I have, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that it's, his interest is in the system and in the um, way his works are organized um, and then executed. Um, so I'd like to know from 
from Ernest how he sees this process in this in this time of lockdown um, if he, his work has evolved in this way um, even now. Thank you Francesca. Well yes, uh, thank you for that um, opportunity to talk about my guess in the future which I think is basically your, your question. Well in a way I think that what we should say is that we're just at the beginning, although I've described like a 50 year history of work in the area, I think that is only like sowing the seeds for what we could do in the future. And if we look at the, the world we're in, one of the most important things is that the delivery over the internet of images, let's say, of sound and images, is in multiple different ways on small phones, on big phones, on tablets, on little screens, on big screens, on um, video walls, and so on. Now, I think there's something that as artists we have to come to grips with, which is known about in the advertising world. And it's strange because I normally like to say that the advertising world learns from the artists, but I think in this case it might be the other way around. And it's something to do with branding. What the um, advertising people do is try to find a way of promoting a brand so that you see the brand as being the same thing on the many, many different platforms and ways in which you come across it. Whether it's on a box, on the side of a bus, on a phone, or on a computer, or whatever. And that's quite an interesting problem. As artists, we tend to be used to delivering on some very specific something. Um, historically, for example, I don't like to show my work on somebody else's screen. I actually choose the physical screen, not just say, here's a file. Um, or I'm talking with the people about an exhibition at the moment, and I'm uh, making sure they get hold of some particular monitors in order to show my work. So I'm being very fussy about <clears throat> how it's displayed. But that just doesn't work in this world, in this network modern world. And so one of the challenges for art is to think how the same thing can be delivered in these quite different contexts and have the same <clears throat> experience, you might say, or a very closely related experience, and how you can move between one and another. I mean, we have this notion that you can start watching a movie on your phone and when you get home you sit down and you watch the end of it on the television and it switches over. All of these concepts are ones that we haven't really tackled yet. I'm not giving any answers, I'm only saying these are the issues that we need to deal with. And I don't think we find them difficult because other people have tackled these problems, but they're things that we need to wrestle with as artists. I think that um, what this will mean is that we will achieve something which I think artists have wanted to achieve for a long time, which is cross-cultural, um, uh, cross-continent art that, that actually brings us together, brings the world together. And so I think that's the kind of direction for the future, what it means in detail, I don't know. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think um, Dave and Fenya um, have raised their hand, so I'll unmute you. Okay, Dave, uh, are you there? Uh, it was an accident. I don't know why it's appeared. I haven't touched it. So. <laughs> okay, um, I shall mute you again. Um, do we have any other um, questions? Again, raise your hand and I'll bring you in. I think we have Nancy. I am curious how you are able to, I mean, it sounds like you want to control the, the experience by choosing the um, screens that you have your work shown through when you're in an exhibition situation. And I'm curious if that 
control is around your a desire to manage the color uh, or the resolution or the size or all of the above. Okay, well quickly, and I was saying of what I have done in the past, all of the above. Okay. I mean, when I make an artwork, I want to control everything. For example, I would be unhappy um, to give a gallery a painting and say, put it into any old frame you like. If they want to put it in a frame, I'd want to know what frame they're putting it in. I'd probably want to choose the frame or even say, don't frame it. So, and I don't think that would be strange. That's quite normal. And I normally, I even ship screens to galleries to make sure that the screen is the one I wanted. Yes, the color is very important in my work, but the, but the resolution, the size, and also the kind of things around it, like, um, does it have a frame? If it's got a frame, uh, what sort of frame is it? How is it designed? All these things are part of the artwork. They are normally. But my point that I was making here is that to make network art for the modern age, it's impossible to do that and the art has to not demand that. So although for my, let's say, gallery or home individual artwork, I will continue to be really fussy in these kind of room details about everything. But for my network art, I have to very much not only not be fussy, but make the art so that it doesn't actually matter what the screen is that it's on. And then I have a follow-up question. Um, you know, with, with so many different devices and platforms, it's also the format that is affected by the user and not the artist. And I wondered um, how you feel about that, vertical, horizontal, square. Yeah. So that's a, good, a very good uh, point to make uh, because that, what, what that implies I th is that the, that kind of format, like whether it's horizontal or vertical and so on, has to be part of the interaction that is handed over to the participant. So I've been interested, some of you know, I worked with Strau Kornock and we talked to the computer graphics conference 50 years ago about how interaction was important, what it is. But what, what it is that forms that interaction is something that is changing all the time. And now, um, one of those things, for example, is a phone, you can hang, hold it vertically or horizontally. Very obviously you can. Um, and so that has to be taken into account. So that is now put into the hands of the user or the participant. And the art has to live with that and make the art has to work in both ways. Um, so we are, of course, in all interactive art, handing over some of the creative decision-making, some of the creativity to the participants. That's all for the good. That's part of the idea, really. And in many ways, what's being handed over is growing and growing in the modern world. So do you, um, do, do you design, like they do with websites, media queries into the coding of a piece so that you would, say, have a version of an image if they are using a phone versus a version of the image if they are using a desktop? Uh, well, yes, that's one way to do it. There are two things, two basic strategies, both of which I think are important to use. One is to make those queries and then, as it were, provide something different. The other is to make something that actually works aesthetically in, in, in each way or in every way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have um, Bronak here actually, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Hopefully, um, Bronak, you're able to join us. Yeah, Brona here. Um, Ernest, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, as ever, Thanks very much. lucid and um, thought provoking. Um, two things came to mind that I thought I would ask you about. Um, you can answer in either order. Um, the first one was, um, at what level, you know, when you took his, what you were doing in the early 70s, um, no one else was doing that kind of thing, you know, it stands out as critically, historically 
significant insofar as it's breaking new ground and you know it has longevity on that level but because we're not living in a saturated media world um where all kinds of things are going on too much in a way um we you know yet again we might be looking for something different than just the immersive screen-based color experience so do you feel in any way that artists engaging with network lockdown scenarios should be doing something that's breaking the mold and how might that be and how might that happen and then my second question was i loved your distinction between print and screen and um, it did occur to me though that um the way print is now evolving you know, a lot of innovation in that area whether you foresee any way in which that has, might hybridize to allow for transmission to bring print into the frame of your own work in the same way that you join this difference can you see that collapsing in any way now or in future thanks brother i'll answer the second question first actually because um i mean the quick answer is yes but it's quite complicated because the hybrid thing comes could come from the fact that new forms of printing could and will include ways of incorporating um, transmitted light in some way and so that would then be hybrid and one would have to take account of that but insofar as the print only uses reflected light it is a matter of physics that it's different to the light you get from a screen and so there's no way of um, overcoming physics as far as I know unless we believe in magic which I happen not to others may but I don't um, so but the hybrid may be possible because the technology would, would change so printing will mean something different um, very probably the first point is really important I mean what to, to frame it differently back in the early 70s and so on what the work I was describing was doing was actually trying to push the technology forward in order to push the art forward and I've always said that it's not very interesting for artists to use that just use the technology they could go down the high street and buy um, artists through the ages have always worked with the media that they've uh, used and often developed it further than uh, it, it had existed before them and so yes I do think that we need to be engaging with the technology questioning the technology and pushing it forward and finding new not only new things to do with it but new ways to make it work probably that's for younger people than me to do although i'm very pleased to try and i will try but certainly it's the goal it should be the goal i think Okay, thanks very much. Uh, any um, follow on from that or? Okay, uh, I have somebody here with their hand up, but it, it's Anna. I don't know if it's a fresh request, so I shall allow you to talk and let me know. Anna Notaro. Oh, maybe not. Okay, well, um, I have a, a couple of thoughts as well that um, I'd like to sort of bring in. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about um, network art and uh, something I've sort of come to realise is that we actually need a way, I think, we need a way of thinking about the properties of network art and connected art um, that describes the aesthetic quality of them and the um, sense of interacting with them. And I use the term, as you know, connectedness. And, and I use that because I want to try and get across to people the idea that a great connected artwork would somehow have an abundance of this property connectedness you would really feel connected through it um, so I'd like to know maybe a few thoughts on that and how if it's not the term connectedness how else might you be able to appreciate network art in a different way to maybe a non-connected art thanks for that Sean yes um, I think if you if you like the language the critical language that we need has to be expanded and Brona who we were talking a few moments ago and I had quite a lot of conversations about that need quite a few years ago um, and we still need it it's not been done really um, the point is uh, 
if we're talking about a painting, we might talk about color and form mm -hmm. and, and so on and a few other important things. But uh, for, the, for this kind of work, certainly there's interactivity and certainly connectedness, um, like the degree, and there are issues to do with experience. And I think it becomes more and more necessary to find a language that deals with the experience of the work. Uh, and not just the physical characteristics of the work. And connectedness could be one of those, like the feeling of connectedness that you get from it, for example. Um, I, I'm not sure what these terms are, to be quite frank, so I don't have a real answer for you. But I do think it's a very important issue to, to address. And I think, uh, and I don't have a word here, but I think that a point that I was making earlier about how this kind of art can move across from one medium to another. And the must, we must have a word or we must invent one if we don't have one <coughs> to deal with the feeling of closeness between the different forms in which we come across the word. Something like a branding, only that's not the word that I think any of us would want to use for this. Mm -hmm. um, great, and, and maybe actually I've got a question, couple of questions here that people have typed in, and um, two of them I think follow on from what you were just saying then. So um, uh, Radu uh, Tikiu, hopefully I'm presenting, uh, pronouncing that correctly, um, wanted to know if you've experimented with networking subjects, not only across geographies, but across levels of civilization or education. Um, for example, Manhattan and Amazonian jungle or Berlin and rural Tibet? Mm -hmm. uh, if yes, how was the experience perceived by the two ends of the network? Uh, the answer is I haven't done that, although I've thought about that quite a lot and uh, I do know some people who have done some work uh, in that way. I think it's a very important question um, and I think uh, when I'm involved in gathering information about these kinds of artworks. I always want to know what the characteristics are of the participants uh, in order to understand it better. But it seems that mostly when I've been involved in that, they've been relatively homogeneous and this question hasn't arisen to the extent that I would like it to. So I think it has to be, uh, we have to go vigorously out there and try to set things up. Now I haven't really done that. It is a very important question, and I hope you or someone else will tackle it. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting one. And I have another question here from Tracy Harwood, a colleague of ours. Um, so uh, she says marketeers use different platforms as an integrated promotional tool, but recognise that each medium is experienced differently, often by different audiences too. So we're just mentioning that. So adapt the content accordingly to tell the same brand story. Is this something that may be um, adaptive for your artworks, art systems, and I think this is really what you were just saying, actually, different media, different people. Yes, so Tracy, thanks for that. That's an important point. And w when I was talking earlier with, uh, I forget which person now, frankly, but uh, about um, different ways of dealing with this. So do you make inquiry through the system about what kind of device it is that we're talking to and so on? Um, then, by doing that, we can actually deal with, with this issue a bit. So we can say, we know this is on a very expensive smartphone, or we know this is on a public display or something, uh, and, and deliver something different. Um, so yes, that is, that is one way um, of dealing with it. But it's a bit hard to know, to cr classify people. And in a way, art is normally questioning people at the boundaries of their thinking in some way or another and pushing them and not assuming too much about them. Uh, so it can be um, quite difficult uh, to do this. We can't do like doing a market survey first, for example, wouldn't kind of be in the normal realm of things that an artist would want to do. So yes, it's important, but how does it, uh, how do we do it? I don't know, except that I think that, 
I think that um, recognizing that uh, the artwork may be being delivered on a different device in a different context, which is often, you can often assume by the device, is something that's important and will influence the artwork. And we do need to inquire what that device is and probably deliver it differently. I, for example, use different colors ranges. I change the colors for um, a, um, a video wall in a street, in the street against what I do on a phone or an artwork in a home. They're all, they may be the, the same kind of artwork, but they look different when you see them because I make them different because those different contexts are different. And I assume that people will see them in a, in a different way. So if it's in the street, you probably won't walk past it. You may walk past it a few times. If it's on your home, you may sit, see there and sit there near it and look at it. And you may see it on and off all day long or for several days, especially in a lockdown situation. Mm. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Um, we're up to roughly our hour, but um, hopefully people are happy to continue um, the questions. They're very interesting. So um, Paul Hertz, I'm going to um, hand over to you. Hopefully, if you activate your microphone, you can talk. Okay. I, I hope I'm unmuted there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so you were talking way back in shaping form about the presence of multiple people in creating the artwork. And we also have in uh, situations for all kinds of algorithmic artwork, uh, for example, Paul Brown's prints, we know that it's actually the concrete manifestation of an algorithm that could have produced many different prints and they would all in a sense be the same as a product of the algorithm. So we have both this social production where the artwork perhaps even requires multiple people to express its full repertory of experience. We have the algorithmics engine that could produce multiples, but per perhaps for each individual experience produces only one. And then we have the multiplicity of the media through which the work can migrate. So my question is, how do we ever pin this down if we want to archive the work or even satisfactorily describe it? Okay, now there's a really hard question that I think many of us are trying to work on uh, what to do about this. So here's the point that the, the work um, lives um, as a result of its interaction with the world around it. So if it's purely generative, like in many of Paul Brown's works, for example, if you have the algorithm, then you have the essence of the work. And if you have the mapping between the elements of the algorithm and the physical reality, you know everything about the work. Um, and I make works like that myself. But if that work also interacts with people or the environment in some other way, then what's happening is, in effect, the generative process is being bent, modified, extended, um, changed in one way or another by the, those interactions. And so without knowing the history of those interactions, we can't know uh, what the work will be. Okay, now I don't know if any of you are watching a rather strange TV series on at the moment called Dev. <laughs> But if you watched it, you would see that this is based on this notion uh, that if everything is determined and every action, every event in the world is determined uniquely by what happened before it, then of course you could predict what happens in the future and you could find out exactly what happened in the past. And if the uh, connivance of the story of Dev is correct, then we would have the answer to your question. But as I guess the, the, uh, the connivance in that story is, even if theoretically or philosophically you might like, like it, is not practically correct, then the answer is there is no answer. And so all we can do is document and preserve the work's behavioral characteristics, just like we do if it doesn't interact, including how it interacts. 
and make recordings of what it looks like, how it performs and so on as it proceeds. And perhaps at the same time, record interviews and discussions with people who experience it. And all of this information provides a kind of record of it. Maybe it's not so different to preserving and thinking about theatre. Uh, we can't recreate uh, a 1902 performance of Macbeth, but maybe if it was important enough and it was recorded enough, we can find out quite a lot about it. That's the same kind of thing. So this preservation is a really big problem, but mm -hmm. what I've said is kind of like the, the way forward, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, question from Benjamin Baxter. Hi, good evening. My question is related um, to this lockdown and how much we're using the internet. Um, and I was wondering, in the, with the rise of internet censorship, how might that affect network art? Um, and also, is there a possibility of it existing on the dark net at all? Okay, so uh, I think the answer is uh, there's every possibility of censorship uh, affecting internet art. Uh, and what we know historically is that art is often in the front line of being censored by many regimes historically. Um, and I don't see that internet art is likely to be any different. So yes, it's a problem, but it's always a problem, especially with authoritarian regimes. Um, it's been it's, it's common in the past, as you know very well, um, and I don't think it's likely to be any different now. And of course, the technologies uh, have grown for providing that. I think the dark net, well, I don't use or take an interest in the dark net personally, so I don't know anything much about it in terms of my own experience, but I'm quite sure that there will be artists who are already working on the dark net. Um, artists explore every avenue that's open, I think. And so, yes. But I don't know that that, in the end, would overcome this problem. I suspect that even there, there will be ways uh, for people to interfere with that material. It will be evolved. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? Okay, no one's raised their hand. So, um, I, oh, okay, Terry, um, I shall allow you to talk, Terry. Hopefully you can um, hear me. I've just unmuted myself. Ah, lovely. Uh, thank you, Sean, for organizing this and Ernest for your talk. Um, it, there's lots of discussion at the moment that the world will never be the same again after this particular lockdown. I suspect that's true. And it seems to me that it might, and I think you've indicated this very well, Ernest, indicate a whole new way in which artists can really influence the way things happen in the future. Um, they've always aimed to be in the forefront of uh, new thinking, uh, new ways of doing things, new ways of grappling with problems. Uh, it just seems now um, it, it's offering an opportunity of doing just that. In other words, art shouldn't be confined to the huge cathedrals of art that we know about so well, but it comes out in everyday life uh, everyday screens and so on, as I think you've been. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So thank you for that, Terry. Yes, and I, I think perhaps the main message that I would like to uh, convey is that in my view, the issue is not about how we deliver art and that using the internet to deliver the art we have or art like it, that is really not the point. Uh, the point is, how do we make new art? How do we make art that's relevant and that has the uh, effects that you're 
talking about. So art, so it's a challenge to artists to work in this world that we're in now. And I think myself, um, that art will be different as a result. It won't just be that museums will operate differently, which they will, uh, but that's really a rather minor part of it by comparison to the fact that art will be different itself. Mm -hmm. in forms. Yeah. So thank you, Tara. Thank you. Okay, so um, any more questions? Anyone like to raise their hand? Okay, well, if you think of something while I'm talking, um, raise your hand and I'll um, come back to these at the end. Um, so I think we should say thank you very much to uh, Ernest Edmonds. Now, we don't really have the ability to give applause. I'll just have to do it myself. <laughs> in <the mood> of <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I think it was a very interesting talk. And um, I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, have found it very valuable. Um, I think I wanted to mention just a couple of other things as well about this um, seminar series, which... Um, we set up as a one-off and it seems to have gone down quite well so we're now thinking about not just the next one but future ones as well so the plan at the moment if you go to the Peter Art Society website you'll see the latest um, schedule but next week is going to be a series of short talks by people who are in this audience who volunteered their interest and their willingness to participate so it'll be a one-hour session again but the talks by six or seven participants will be including questions less than 10 minutes each and this is predominantly from people who have basically become our audience i don't know a huge amount about some of them but i thought it'd be interesting for the audience to really um, take the lead in one session and then after that we'll organize an additional series of seminars um, we will have four main speakers so four weekly speakers and then we'll finish with a, a series of short talks again. That seems to be quite a nice way of running a season. Um, and I just have to check myself on the dates there. But we will be running those next week and the week after to finish this season. We'll probably have a short gap, maybe just one, one week, I think. And then we'll start again, as I just get the, I should have prepared this already, but as I just get this list up. We'll start again on the 12th of May. So you've got the 28th of May today, that's Ernest. Next week, the short talks. 12th of May, Andy Lomaz will be giving us a talk. Um, we have a couple of slots that I am talking to people about but aren't yet um, filled. Um, Board and Research um, have just agreed to do a talk on the 26th of May. And the short talks will be on the 9th of June. So that's um, almost a month's worth of activities. Um, if we're all still in lockdown and there's still interest, then we'll carry on doing these, I think, um, um, in these seasons. Otherwise, I think, as I mentioned earlier, we'll go for a slightly sh um, less frequent program, maybe, but we'll continue doing things online. It seems to be a really good way of getting um, uh, a good audience for some of the um, things that we're doing. Um, so I just wanted to uh, mention that. And then I think, oh, yes, I've made a few polls. I popped a few polls up during the... Um, session here and I wanted to find out a few things so one was rough where are people coming from and I think it's very interesting to know that most people almost half of people um, arrive here via our mailing list so we're talking about all these wonderful new technologies but it's our mailing list something we've been running for years and years that seems to be the best way of reaching people followed by Facebook and various other things as well so thank you for letting me know there um, uh, other questions oh I'm just bringing them up to remind myself um, well, it certainly was a, if you were, uh, might be interested in some sort of seminar event, maybe where we have three or four speakers and then we charge a small amount as a way of raising money for um, our computer arts archive. And there was a sort of 75% of people would be interested in that. So we'll have a little think about that and maybe come up with something later in the year where we do an online seminar, um, a variety of speakers, possibly with a theme. Um, maybe as, as a way of raising funds for our computer arts archive project. Um, and then there was a question about the, uh, the two ways in which we can run these talks as, as meetings or um, seminars, a pretty even split. Um, I have to say from my side, it's a lot easier to manage the questions in this more slightly more formal format. But if anybody has any particular thoughts about that, feel free just to get in touch via the website or um, um, Facebook and we'll, um, we'll go with what people want really. Okay, um, so they were all the little thoughts from me at the end. Um, 
thanks very much again for everyone coming along. We had a good audience, about 67 people at um, peak. Um, not surprised. It was a very um, good talk. I think people knew it was going to be an interesting talk. So uh, thanks again for Ernest. Um, if you want to review the video, um, we have been recording it and it will end up on YouTube within a day. I don't think the stream to Facebook worked this time, so a bit more work on that to find out why that was the case. Um, but in the future, hopefully, um, we'll have them running on Facebook at the same time as running on, um, on Zoom for those who don't want to come to Zoom. Um, and I'm just going to quickly check um, chat and questions for anything else. Um, okay, I think the questions have been asked and the web chat here. Uh, lots of people saying um, thanks very much from Portugal. I know we have people all over the world here. So um, and thank you uh, for all coming along and I hope you enjoyed the uh, talk today. Thanks again, Ernest. Okay, thank you and goodbye. I shall um, be ending the meeting. <laughs>